Yes, sir. I have a question here. Brother Ruckman, in uh, the first epistle of John, uh, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've heard some preaching uh, to where people have said that uh, doctrinally that doesn't apply to us as far as if we sin, all our sin is under the blood of Calvary versus this uh, verse right here. I've heard preaching saying that if we sin, we're out of fellowship of God Okay, versus uh, all our sin under the blood of Calvary. Uh -huh. All right. Now, this problem here has to do with the difference between judicial forgiveness and practical forgiveness. And in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, you're told that you already have forgiveness of sins through Christ's uh, effectual sacrifice. And the question comes up, why do you have to ask forgiveness and confess them if they've already been forgiven? Colossians 1, 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And that forgiveness of sin is a past thing, according to Ephesians. We'll look at Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 32. Ephesians 4, 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath past tense forgiven you. Now, the idea is the blood covers all the sin, and it does, and the shedding of blood takes care of forgiveness of sin, and it does, and God has forgiven you for sin, and he has, then how can we apply this thing here and say, uh, uh, if we confess our sin, he is faithful just to forgive us our sins? Because the implication would be if you didn't confess your sins, then he wouldn't forgive your sins. And yet he just said they're forgiven. Now the hyperdispensational teaching on that is this. The hyperdispensational teaching is, since Christ's one substitutionary vicarious effective atonement has taken care of your sin, they're all forgiven, that you never have to confess your sins because they're automatically forgiven. Now, that's a dangerous teaching. And I'll tell you why it's dangerous. First of all, because 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, For this cause many among you are sickly, and many weak, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chased in the Lord, we should not be condemned of the world. That's saying God's going to chasten a Christian that doesn't judge his sins. Oh, now, they may be forgiven, but you're told to judge them after they're forgiven. And you're told if you don't judge them, you'll get weak, and you'll, si and you'll get sick, and you'll sleep. The Lord will kill you. So this teaching that you don't ever have to confess your sin because they're judicially forgiven is a dangerous teaching. And another reason why it's dangerous is because your relationship to God as your Savior is a relationship of a child or a father. And your father, your father can forgive you judicially and yet still things not be right. Suppose you have a boy, and you come home, and you find out your boy is kicked out the window and spit on your wife and soaked the cat in gasoline and set fire to it. <laughs> and you take your boy and whip your boy, and your boy doesn't own up to it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You did do it. Your wife says you did. Saw him do it. You know what I'd do? I'd whip him again. But I finally says, oh, I did it, but I'm not sorry for it. What are you going to do with that thing? Folks says, oh, you, 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 you cruel people who beating your kids, <laughs> child neglect, child abuse. I saw a good car, sign in the car the other day and said, have you flogged your child lately? <laughs> <laughs> I saw another governor said, it's, it said, it's, it said, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your cat is? <laughs> I'd whip them again. I'd whip my kids until they confessed and said they were sorry. And uh, i never forget one time, I was out, well, I just whipped Pete. He must have been about five years old, and I'd got him good. He was hollering and screaming bloody murder. And after I got through with him, he was, you know, about ten minutes after that, and I was around behind the garage, and Mike and Pete were around the other side of the garage talking, and Mike didn't know I was there. And I heard Pete say, I heard Mike say, oh, quit your, quit your squalling, you ain't hurt. Mike was about, you know, nine. And Pete said, well, boy, you got whipped like I got whipped. You holler. And Mike said, no, I wouldn't. And Pete said, well, Daddy, his hard. And Mike said, he couldn't make me cry. 
And I came around the corner, and I said, what'd you say, boy? <laughs> and I'll tell you, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll say this for him. He really tried. He tried to bluff his way through. I mean, he drew him up to his full height, you know, about four feet eight, <laughs> and said, well, you couldn't. So I got me a switch about that long, and about big around one end is a darn needle, about big around the other is your thumb, and, you know, gave it a few practice strokes, you know. It, you know, you can tell when that thing goes for the air, it doesn't have your best interest at heart, you know. <laughs> you know, and I came around there, slapped that kid. And I, I'll, I'll give him credit. He had guts. I mean, he determined he wasn't going to yell, boy. I mean, he clamped his mouth, boy, and his face turned beet red. And I came out and smacked him again. And boy, the third time I hit him, you could have hurt him for a country mile. <laughs> and somebody said, what a terrible thing to do. No, you got to teach a kid a kid can't talk that way. That ain't right. That ain't right. You teach a kid, you get a kid like that, like that, you get a kid headed for the penitentiary. Don't you ever, don't you grown up say, don't you ever look at God and say, you can't make me cry. I know a guy that did that. His name is Henley. And old Henley had a trouble with one of his feet. I guess it was diabetes or gangrene or something. They, they cut off his uh, uh, foot without an anesthesia. I mean, saw it right through the bone. And then they cut off his leg a little bit later at the knee. No anesthesia at the bone. About the time he called it the third, he wrote a poem, and that poem says, In the fell clutch of circumstance, uh, you know, I've not winced or cried aloud, yet I remain, you know, something in charge, my head, head bloody but unbowed. I am the captain of my fate, I am the master of my soul. It makes no difference how charged with the punishment the scroll, I am the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. He had four operations on his leg with no anesthesia. How he survived him, I don't know. And I mean, hacksaw right through the bone, boy. Conscious. Fully conscious. Bragging about, you know. You know, he died. Don't happen about five years after that. He died of a broken heart. You know, Lord God, Lord God, did he kill his little nine-year-old girl. That killed him. You know what that fellow was? He was a blank fool. A blank fool. Read that stuff, folks. What a brave, courageous man. He was a blank fool. Don't you ever tell God you can't make me cry. He'll take out a whip boy and put you through your paces. You hop, skip, and jump. All right, now this thing, we're not through with this thing here. <laughs> now this, this confession here, this confession here, see, is a different kind of thing than judicial forgiveness. In judicial forgiveness, I can forgive my boy because God has forgiven me. I can forgive my boy because I remember I was a boy once too. But things aren't right between him and me till he apologizes. We're out of fellowship. Now look at the context of this, path, this, chap, this uh, verse right here. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Seven, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. That's present. That's practical. That's not talking about judicial in the past. That's talking about a present cleansing right now. He's not talking about a once-for-all act that cleared the record. He's talking about something that takes place from day to day that keeps you in fellowship with God and keeps you walking in the light. So the sins should be judged and they should be confessed, and whether or not you get out of fellowship with God, and then God has to whoop you. Or right, something else. Yes, sir. Right now, that's fine and settled. But then how about when they say... The only doctrine for us is in the Pauline epistles, and that that's supposed to be tribulation. Only doctrine in the Pauline epistles? All right, for that, you take them to first or second Timothy. Make it first Timothy, and ask them what this is. First Timothy, first Timothy chapter six. Now about that Pauline epistle, three. If any man teach otherwise, consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what those words are? They're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Paul says that Christian doctrine, the body of Christ, a lot of that stuff. A lot of that stuff is. A lot of it is. You see, in plain words, you can't limit Christian doctrine to Pauline epistles. You can use, now listen, you can use the Pauline epistles as a standard 
by which to judge other doctrines. You can do that, but you can't limit it. If you limit the Pauline epistles, you know what you tried to get rid of? Let me, let me show what you got rid of. Be doer of the word, not hearers only. Don't tell me that isn't for a Christian, you know. Don't tell me that isn't. You have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. You may consume it upon your lusts. Don't tell me that isn't for a Christian. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give liberty to all men that bread. If not, let him ask and shall be given. Don't tell me that isn't for a Christian. Bless the man that endureth temptation, for when he has tried to receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them. Don't tell me that isn't for a Christian. You know what I'm quoting? I'm quoting from an epistle written to the twelve tribes. I'm quoting James. I know stuff I'm giving you is just good a Christian doctrine or anything in the book of Romans. You see, you say, well, Ruckman, how in the world am I going to get all this thing straightened out? Study, study, study. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God. You study. That's how you learn to get it straightened out. Oh, I something else. Just over here behind, Brian, brother, you've got it all right. Um, Jesus Christ in, in Matthew 12, 40, said he'd be in the part of the earth three days and three nights. Can you go over that timetable to show how that thing fits in the resurrection? Order? All right. Talking about Jesus Christ being the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Now that fits in with the resurrection. Well, that thing works is this. That Jew counts the night before the day, and he does that because of Genesis 1. Genesis 1 said the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, the evening and the morning were the third day. And one way you know that thing, and he said, even more on the first day, even more on the second day, even more on the third day, even more on the fourth day, even more on the fifth day, even more on the sixth day. And when he gets that seventh day, he doesn't say there's any evening and morning to it. You ever notice that? He says, evening and morning, six, when he gets that seventh one, there's no evening and morning to it. Now, you know why that is? Because he says, one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Therefore, this earth is going to be here 4,000 years, and Christ is going to die on the cross. This earth is going to be 2,000 years, and the Lord is going to come back. And when he sets up that 1,000-year kingdom, there's no end to it. See? So it doesn't go in an evening and a morning. It just goes on forever. See? Oh, let me tell you, man. That book, to that book together is put, that put together like a human organism. All right, now you take a thing right there, that evening and morning is, is how it's given. So we talk about three days and three nights. What we got to figure here for, we got to figure, first of all, three nights first. All right, we have Christ crucified on Wednesday, not on Friday. That Good Friday and all that stuff, you know, just Catholic bunk, you know. Good Friday, bad Saturday, Tennessee Saturday night, Sunday, Monday always. Shrove Tuesday, Ash Wednesday, Catfish Friday, all that kind of business. <laughs> all right, now that thing is laid out like that, and he's crucified Wednesday. So he spends all Wednesday night in the tomb. That's one night. He spends all Thursday night in the tomb. That's the second night. He spends all Friday night in the tomb. That's the third night. All right, there are three literal nights of 12 hours apiece he's in that tomb. That's uh, 6 in the evening or 6 in the morning. All right, then he's in that thing all day Thursday. That's the first day. He's in there all day Friday. That's the second day. He's in there all day Saturday. That's the third day. It's a literal three days and three nights. And the Catholic stuff is just more of that same old godless, depraved rubbish they've been putting out for years. Christ crucified the dogwood tree and the shroud of Turin, and Mary went back to heaven, and Mary was born sinless, and blah, 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 blah. All that pagan stuff, and nothing that bunch of bunk. All right, he comes up from the dead at 6 o'clock Saturday night. How would that be the first day of the week? The Jewish first day of the week begins at 6 o'clock Saturday night, because the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day. So 6 o'clock Saturday night is the beginning of Sunday. So he comes up on the first day of the week. Now, the problem the people always get into is they keep thinking about Christ coming up around 6 in the morning Sunday. But that would give another, see, that would give another oh, night and a part of a day in there. But that doesn't work. When they came to the tomb, he'd already gone. And it was open, and he'd been gone. He'd been gone for hours. But, folks, the stone was not rolled back to get Christ out. People keep him thinking, well, he came up when the stone rolled back, and he, he didn't have to roll any stone to go anywhere. 
He went down the heart of the earth and came back up. If he went down through sedimentary rock and metamorphic rock and igneous rock and down in the core and back up again, what would he have to have a stone roll back for to get out? That is, no, when they came in the tomb and found his lion there, they found the, the, the linen wrapped around the body with no body in the linen. The body came through the linen. So they don't worry about a stone. The stone is rolled back so they can go in and see that he's not there. All right, so they come out at 6 o'clock here, and the question comes up, where was he between 6 o'clock and 6 in the morning? And that's, that's quite a conjecture. I read in my Bible where the bodies of many of the saints that slept arose and were seen in the city following his resurrection, which means Saturday night was Halloween night in downtown Jerusalem. <laughs> I mean, there's just so much... There's so much, you know, that you don't, you just read through the Bible, and you get read through it so fast, you don't see what's going on. Well, if those bodies came up after sundown Saturday night and went to Jerusalem, Saturday night must have been a panic in downtown Jerusalem. I don't know who appeared down there, but I've often thought about it. I've often thought about what if Samuel came down there, the high priest, and came to Anus and Caiaphas and said, well, boys, you blew that one, didn't you? You know, (laughs) So he comes up about at 6 o'clock. And then he's hanging around at 6 o'clock Sunday morning, but then he's already been out of the tomb men for 12 hours. And he hadn't gone up yet, because he tells Mary, he said, don't touch me, I have not yet ascended. So the answer to that is the Lord's in that tomb a literal three days and literal three nights, and Good Friday is just, that's just more of that godless pagan clap trap to get over here all the time. Nothing to it at all. Yeah. Dr. Rutten, when I uh, study about the history of the English Bible, every time I get to uh, anybody's writings on uh, the Wycliffe Bible, uh-huh. there's always a controversy on if he translated that from the Vulgate or from some other Bible that lines up with the manuscripts of the King James Bible. Uh-huh. Have you got a brother back on that table anywhere? You got a church history volume one back there anywhere? You don't have one. Anybody got one anywhere in the building? Nearby, where you get a hold of it, about John Purvey. Yes, he gave me a copy of that, uh, chapter one, or volume one. I'm trying to think of a scriptural way to answer this thing. It's a matter of church history, it's not a matter of scripture, but, uh, I'm trying to think of a case where somebody messed with the words after they were printed. Well, turn to Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. case there was where a revision committee goes to work on a thing, so it comes out and appears to be something it's not. And it has to do with simply perverting the Word of God. And the uh, statement is mentioned, I think, in uh, Jeremiah 23. I want a, I want a passage here Maybe it's not Jeremiah 23. It's sure in Jeremiah, though. I want a passage that says, You have perverted the word of the living God. 23.36. There it is. And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more, for every man the word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the word of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. Now, the case with Wycliffe is, when Wycliffe translated, he's supposed to have translated just from the Latin Vulgate. That's the common teaching about it. Uh, he did translate from Latin, that's true. But there's a question about some pastors in the Latin, whether he translated from Jerome's Latin Vulgate or from the Old Latin. And the material I have in, in Church History, Volume 1, taken from the Shaw, would indicate that after he was dead, a man named John Purvey took some of his verses out and lined them up with Jerome where they had not been translated from Jerome. And if all Wycliffe was, did was just use Latin, if he was the old Latin, all he did, to all practical purposes, was trying to get a King James Bible. Because Jerome sometimes, Jerome sometimes bars from the old Latin against the Greek. And sometimes Jerome is right in doing that. Then in other places, Jerome rejects the old Latin for the Greek and uses the corrupt Greek, like Luke 2.33 and some of those places. So you'd have to check those definite places. But that Church History, Volume 1, is the documented evidence to show that when Wycliffe died, a man named John Purvey edited the work and republished the work, and John Purvey, who'd been working with Wycliffe, Wycliffe, renounced his Protestant faith and went back into the Catholic Church. Which means that if you find a copy of Wycliffe now that is verbatim from Jerome's Latin Vulgate, it's edited by John Purvey. 
not by John Wycliffe. But that's in chapter, in volume one of that thing. I don't have it run on me right now. If you can find one, I'll give you the, the bibliography on it. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Yes. And is there any evidence that can be pointed to that it was actually written in Greek? For myself, I wondered how do we know the Epistle of Romans wasn't written in Latin since they spoke yeah. Latin and Rome? You know, yeah. 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 I have one from the first century. It's a little piece of paper called P52 that contains part of John 18, and it is in Greek. But then again, they've got some old copies of Matthew, and some of them are found in Coptic and Hebrew. So we take for granted, thank you, brother, we take for granted the originals were written in Greek, but if you want an actual documentary evidence to prove they were written in Greek, the answer to that is there isn't any. There isn't any. Nothing says God's going to write it in Greek, and nothing said it was written in Greek. On to this thing here on, uh, let me get you this thing here in Wycliffe, 289, 309. All right, uh, here, Wycliffe. As all the Antiochian Christian was a Bible literalist who believed the Bible with the absolute and final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Wycliffe was a bibliolater, for he thought that every syllable of the New Testament was true, and nothing was to be believed was not found upon the book. Wycliffe charged the Roman Catholics with heresy in denying the lady the privilege of having the Bible in their own language. He rejected infant baptism, Mariology, purgatory, prayers for the dead, the rosary, the worship of relics, the mass, and the apocrypha. Now, Nicholas Hereford translated the apocryphal books which were struck in the Wycliffe's translation to make it appear that Wycliffe had used only the official Roman Catholic Bible from North Africa. John Purvey revised the work later. 126. 14, 126. Revised the work later. 14. Thirteen. Fourteen, one twenty-six. Uh, so, 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 so. One twenty-six. Philip Schaff, Volume Six, History of the Christian Church, page three hundred and forty-three. For that documentation is uh, John Purvey revised the work later to bring it closer to Jerome, make it look like it's in the Vulgate. But Purvey, though a lollard, recanted on his beliefs in fourteen hundred A.D after being in prison, and when he swore to marry he'd be a good boy, he was promoted to the vicarage of Hythe by the Catholic Archbishop. 127, Schaff, Volume 6, page 343, footnote 121. Of John Wycliffe and his English Bible, this Archbishop said, quote, that pestilent wretch of damnable memory, forerunner and disciple of Antichrist. So the archbishop who promoted this fellow John Fur Furby back into the ministry and got him a vicarage, he damned Wycliffe, and Furby had to go along that fellow in order to get back in the ministry. So, probably. And probably you can say this. You can say 95% Vulgate and 5% Old Latin. But after all, the King James is just about that. That's about what the King James is. All right. Yeah, yes, sir. Go ahead. When I go to Germany as a missionary there, can I tell the German people that they have or can have a perfect German Bible, or is this going to be the only one in the world? If I were you and I was going to Germany, I would uh, use Martin Luther's Heiliger Schrift, Martin Luther's Bible. I'll show you why that is. Uh, you have a Texas Receptus Greek coming out, and that Greek goes into all these languages before the King James comes out. It goes into Tyndale. 
who put the Apocrypha between the Testaments. It goes Geneva before the Apocrypha is put in the Testaments. It goes into Matthews with the Apocrypha put between the Testaments. The English Bibles will not put the Apocrypha in as part of the Old Testament. Coverdale, none of these do. The Bishop's Bible, and there are several others. And finally, the A.D. of 1611. Now, while this stuff is being done, that Greek Testament is going out into Italy in Diodati. And that thing is going out into French in Olivetan. And it's going out into uh, to Spanish as Valera. And it's going out into German as Luther. And those are all receptus translations. And if I was working over there in Germany, I wouldn't shake those people's faith in the German Bible that God used for the Protestant Reformation. I would use a, I would use a German copy of, of Heiliger Schrift. If push came to shove and I was pressed, like you may be pressed for it, then I would recommend a translation that was this published in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, that's come out in about the last ten years, that uh, two Germans at Oshkosh and two in Rochester put together, which is Martin Luther's Heiliger Schrift, with the King James readings put in at the places where Erasmus didn't have them right. And by that, I should have been there. These were Septus Greek manuscripts, were Septus Greek manuscripts, come in a number of editions. The first of those editions is Erasmus. The next one is Theodore Beza. The next one is Stephanus. The next one is Colonnaeus. And the next one is Elzeber. Now those are, those are different editions of the, of the correct Greek text. Just like when you talk about different editions of the corrupt Greek text, the different editions of the corrupt de- Greek text are Nestles, uh, Alfred, uh, Westcott and Hort, uh, Arland, Metzger, Tischendorf, Griesbach, Lachman, Tregellis. Those are corrupt Greek texts. These are the right Greek texts. Now, the variation between Erasmus and Beza are the difference between the variations between 1611 and Luther and between 1611 and Valera. And there's a big argument going on now about well, do we have a, the right Spanish translation, do we have the right German translation? And the answer is you have the one that God in his providence ordained to be used that God has blessed. But if it came to a toss-up between Erasmus edition and Beza's edition, your King James Bible is based on Beza's fifth edition. And Beza's fifth edition has some improvements in it that are not in Erasmus. For example, Erasmus in Luke 2.33 says, His father and his mother marvel at those things spoken by him. Luke 2.33. King James an improvement. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things, see? That's the difference between those two receptuses. So if I was pushed on it, I'd recommend they get the, uh, the, it's still Luther. You see, you won't have the problem in Germany you have here because every Bible translated in German is called a revision of Martin Luther. Every one of them. I don't care what Bible you pick up, it'll say, Übersetzung von Dr. Martinus Luther, translated by Martin Luther. So you can offer them a right revision that brings it in line with the King James, just as well as one that brings it in line with something else. That's a question over here, brother Harris. You didn't hear it. Yeah. All right. Hyperdispensationalism is this teaching. A hyperdispensationalism is the teaching that you can cut the Bible up into sections and then overlaps. Uh, I teach this. I teach in Matthew, you're going from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In Acts, you're going from Israel to the church. In Hebrews, you're going from the church and the tribulation. So these doctrines here are primarily tribulation, but some imply the church age. These are primarily church age, but some apply the Old Testament. These are primarily Old Testament, but some apply the... See, it's a gradual thing. Let me, let me draw it out for you this way. Here's Christ dying on the cross here, and here's the Jew. Here comes his Messiah, and he rejects his Messiah, and God ditches the Jew. Here's the Gentile, he's nobody, but he gets the gospel, and he comes in the ascendancy. And you know what that is there? That's Acts 28. Acts 28, 
when they reasoned a long time, they departed after he spoke this one word. Well, if Isaiah the prophet spoken of you, and these people draw near me with their heart, and their, eye, their heart is far from me, know therefore the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear. But you know something? You know what Paul said in Acts chapter 18? He said, Lo, since you judge yourselves unworthy, we turn to the Gentiles. But you know what he said in 13? <laughs> he said, Since you think you're unworthy of eternal life, we turn to the Gentiles. He said it three times. They're not, it isn't they giving up here. They're giving up here, and giving up here, and giving up here. More to it than that. In Acts chapter 7, God quits dealing with the Jew in Jerusalem. In Acts 13, he quits dealing with the Jew in Asia Minor. In Acts 18, he quits dealing with the Jew in Europe. In Acts 28, he quits dealing with the Jew worldwide. But it's a gradual transition. What a dispensationalist is, he'll try to chop that thing up. Now, hyper-dispensationalists hyper -dispensationalist come in three sizes. There's, they follow Cornelius Stam and J.C. O'Hare and Bullinger. Now, if you follow Cornelius Stam, that's Grace, something, Winona, Indiana, someplace like that, the Berean Searchlight, that's that publication. You say the body of Christ began with Paul, Acts 9. The body of Christ began with Paul. If you're J.C. O'Hare, the body of Christ begins with Acts 18. If you're Bullinger, there's no body till Acts 28. <laughs> now, that's the teaching. Now, that's different fellows on. Now, this position here is nobody's in Christ before Paul's in Christ. Paul's the first one in Christ in Acts 9. Therefore, nothing before Acts 9 is for the body, because there's no body there. <laughs> the body shows up in Acts 9. Now, there are several things wrong with that. First of all, I'll take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts, and the book of Acts, pick up Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, uh, I guess that's Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 3, that's Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 14. This first teaching is there's no body of Christ present until Paul. What I'm reading you right now is many, many years before Paul was saved. Acts chapter 5, verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord. Where were they added if they weren't added to his body? Didn't say, even there the church, they were added to the Lord. Where they get in his head? Let me show you another one now. Come to Romans chapter, Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And this is Paul writing, Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, verse 7, Romans 15, 7, Salute Adronicus and Junia, my kingdom, my fellow prisoners, who have known among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Where were they in Christ if he had no body? I'll show you another one, Galatians chapter 1. These fellows are not rightly dividing the word of truth, they're wrongly dividing the word of truth. Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, verse, uh, no, 13. Galatians 1, 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jewish religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God. Paul was persecuting the church of God before he was saved. Well, what did the church of God mean? Well, according to Stam and the rest of them, it was a Jewish church, and therefore wasn't the body. But come here to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and notice when Paul says the church of God, he's talking about one of the three divisions of humanity. 1 Corinthians 10, 32. When Paul says the church of God, he's never referring to anything but the body. 1 Corinthians 10, 32, give none offense, neither to the Jews, one group, nor to the Gentiles, the other group, nor to the church of God. According to Paul, there are only three groups of people, Jews, Gentiles, the church. That's not a local church there. Outside of the, outside of the body of Christ, the Jew, the Gentile, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. And when Paul wrote that in Corinthians, no doubt about his mind what the church was. For example, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And notice when he talks about the church of God there, he's talking about one baptism of one spirit into one body. Verse 13, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 
Yeah, I'm talking about a local church. First Corinthians twelve thirteen. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. So when he says he persecuted the church of God, he's talking about people who were in a body baptized by one Spirit. I don't know. Come to First Timothy chapter three. Look at it again. Notice when he says church of God, he sure isn't talking about a local church of Jews. First Timothy three fifteen. If I tear long, thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Technically speaking, the church of God, they're the ones that have the, uh, the scriptural name. <laughs> Certainly not church of Christ. The term church of Christ doesn't even occur in the Bible. Church is, but not church. Oh, I see this teaching. There's no body to Acts chapter 9. Paul gets in. Now, when Paul gets in, does he get baptized? When Paul gets saved, does he get baptized? I'm going to say yes. Well, sure he does. And I baptized him. Is Paul baptized in converts in Acts 16? I may say yes. Sure he is. You'll read your Bible what? <laughs> the Philippian jailer washed his stripes and baptized him. All right, now this hyper-dispensationalist wants to get rid of water baptism. Water baptism not for this age. You Baptists are heretics. All right, what are you going to do with it? If the body began with Paul and he got baptized, why don't you get baptized? If Paul is baptized in converts, why don't you baptize your converts? And when, when you do that, you know what the, what the, what the highest participation will say? He'll say, yeah, but, oh, all through here, Paul didn't know about the one body and the one baptism. But I just read you a passage in Corinthians where he did. Now come to Ephesians chapter 3. We start at verse 1. He's about the one spirit and one baptism when he baptized the Philippian jailer. So the hyper that does this is he pretends that until God revealed this thing to Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, he didn't know about it. And since you didn't find about this till Ephesians chapter 3, Paul didn't know about it till after the book of Acts was over. The book of Acts finishes about 60 or 61 A.D. And the date on Ephesians is what, according to what you got there in your notes? What is it? 64. So Paul wrote this after the book of Acts was over. And this is what Paul wrote. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word. Now, you know what a hyper-dispensationist does with that? He claims there's a period of time called the grace of God, the dispensation of the grace of God, see? But that isn't that thing said. He got screwed up on that OV there, that, that OF. That OF can cause more trouble of the word that follows it, is it subject or is it object? Let me show you what I mean. The fear of God. Is that God being afraid of you or you being afraid of God? Well, obviously, God's the object, right? All right, how about the love of God? Is that you loving God or God loving you? Well, then it'd be the subject. You saw anything switched? Look at this here. The truth, the truth of Christ. Is that the truth about Christ or the truth that Christ gave? I'll give you a good one. Jehovah Witness. Jesus Christ is the beginning of the creation of God. Is that all? Throws him out? Is he the beginning of the creation of God? Is God the object? Is God the first one that was created? No. Christ the beginning of what God did. God was the subject. See that thing? That all will mess you up. Or right, now if you want to know how that all goes here, He's going to tell you how it goes. Watch the English. Explain the English now. Come down here, verse uh, 7. Whereby I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me. The dispensation of the grace of God which is given me. Verse 2. They got the thing wrong. It, the, the grace of God was the object. That's what God gave him. God dispensed it to him. See that thing right there? It wasn't a period of time stretched out here called the grace of God. It was what God dispensed to him. God gave him grace for this thing. That's what a dispensary is, where they pass out the medicine. Why, there's no dispensation called the grace of God. I teach, I teach as a, as a fine and distinct dispensation anybody you ever heard in your life. I get more cussing out than any man in this country for teaching 
salvation, tribulation, tribulation and salvation by faith and works. But grace is all through the tribulation. As a matter of fact, grace is through all dispensations. As a matter of fact, going for grace, you all go to hell anyway. See? You can't say there's a dispensation, a period called grace. Good night, man. In, in John, where he says, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ, that make a dispensation of grace begin with John the Baptist. Didn't you ever read, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Grace is found anywhere. Maybe some little cut out there someplace. That's wrongly dividing the word of truth. Two, if you are the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read you understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Now here's the problem. Which in other ages, they make it all through the book of Acts, was not made known to the sons of men as it is now, 64 A.D., revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Why, Paul knew that before the book of Acts was over. He talked about Jew and Gentile being one in Galatians. And Galatians was written years and years before the book of Acts was over. Whereof I made a minister. Nine, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now, I hear what these fellows are saying. They are saying, Paul got saved and got baptized before he had good sense. And he went along here and baptized folks when he was stupid. But when he got over here and God showed him the mystery of the revelation of the one body, he dropped the water of baptism and said, there's one spirit and one baptism. See? And it can't be water. And of course it's not. It is spirit. But once he said one baptism, then they say he must have canceled water baptism up to them. And the thinking of that thing is, since God didn't reveal the mystery to him until here, that all this here is not for the body of Christ. And even though Paul the first in the body, doctrine for the body of Christ cannot begin until after this thing's over. That's the teaching. Now that thing sounds real good. It's got all kinds of holes in it. For example, oh, uh, let's see, I've got two in this pot. You say, to what? I didn't tell you. Now, I suppose I never show you. You never know what they were. Does that mean they're not there? I told them I had two in the pocket here, at, uh, and then about a minute later, I revealed them. It was two quarters. Does that mean they weren't in there before I revealed them? They were in there whether you know they're there or not. You know what that means? The body of Christ can be there whether anybody knows it or not. Now, God revealed it to Paul along about him here someplace, and then he wrote about it in Ephesians over about here someplace. That body began clear back in Acts chapter 2. But who knew about it? Nobody. Now, let me, I can prove my point real easy if you stick with that book. Here, here's the question. It's the uh, first day of the week, and Simon P. and the rest of them are doing the wrong thing on the first day of the week, they're fishing. Out there in the Sea of Galilee, having a good time. Except they had a bad night, they didn't catch any fish. Long about in the morning, they see somebody over on the shore, and John says, who's that? And Pete said, it's the Lord. And the Lord says, come on, boys. <laughs> and Peter jumps in the water and swims the 440 in two minutes flat, comes up on the beach. The rest of them come in and drag the fish and come up there on the beach and sit down. Here's the Lord up here on the beach, and he got these cold, hot coals going. He got barbecue pork for them. And shrimp and lobster and clams and catfish and scallops. Sit down, boys, have something to eat. <laughs> Could they have eaten it? How many say yes? Let me see your hand. How many say no? Let me see your hand. How many don't know? Let me see your hand. <laughs> Does Leviticus 11 say that stuff's an abomination of the Lord? Does Leviticus 11 forbid a, a Jew to eat that stuff? Whatever doesn't have fin in the scales and the waters will be an abomination. You shall not eat it, lest your soul may be, be made abominable like it. You say, but Christ died on the cross. So what? Who knew that? You see, you know it. 
Where'd you find it out from? You found out from Paul. You found, you know, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, the glory of God. Every creature of God is good, nothing be received, be received with thanksgiving and prayer, for to sanctify by the word of God. But did Peter know that? You know when Peter found that out? Acts 10. Of Acts 10, the sheet came down, rise, Peter, kill me. Not so, Lord. <laughs> Don't you see? When Christ died on the cross, all kinds of things were done that nobody knew anything about. If Peter didn't know it was right to eat lobster in Acts chapter 10, do you think anybody knew about the body of Christ being in Acts chapter 2? Nobody. So these fellows are off. Where well, they got off was they thought a thing wasn't present till it was revealed. And that's a bad mistake. A thing would be about a long, around a long time before it's revealed. Why, if, if they come up on that shore and he'd offer them barbecue pork chops, They'd all left it. They'd have probably thought it was the Antichrist. You know, he said, I've got many things to tell you, and I can't tell you them right now because you're unable to bear it. You remember that? Yeah. If you're all in pork shops, they'd have whole back and said, Whew, man, what is this? We got the wrong Messiah. And they left. Do you know why? Because they knew the law. Leviticus. No Jew would think of giving anybody a pork chop. Leviticus 11. But it wouldn't hurt them any. Why? Because God took the handwriting of ordinances contrary to us, took it out of the way, and nailed it to his cross. But who knew that? Nobody. Nobody. So these fellows made a bad mistake. They made the mistake of thinking because Paul doesn't reveal it till here, it doesn't exist till there. They're wrong. It's all through here. It just isn't revealed fully till over in here in Ephesians chapter 4. Which means that water baptism is still for this age, and that's why we baptize them. Paul said, be a follower of me as I'm a follower of Christ. Right? He is baptized. You ought to get baptized. We call those people the dry cleaners. One more question. Well, that'll be it. Yes, sir. Would you please comment just a little on the parable in Luke 16, verses 8 and 9? 16? Yes. All right, verse 8 and 9. What about that steward? All right, we'll start 16 at verse uh, 1. Now, this thing here is, is peculiar in that this, the past he's asking about has been used by, I've heard it used by men who made a lot of money to prove that they ought to, they ought to make more money. All right, 16.1. There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said to him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer a steward. That's a, that's a, uh, that's a, remember I told you to read your Bible to notice the shocking statements and notice the personal statements? Look at that thing. Boy, you realize what you're reading there? You know what's going to happen to you when you die? You may no longer be steward. You know what God has given you right now? Stewardship. You're responsible for a wife or some kids or a church, right? Or a home or a family or a car. You're a steward. You don't own anything you got. You don't own nothing. If it's given to you, amen? Given you to take care of. And somebody you'll be called in, give account of your stewardship. You may no longer be steward. I mean, boy, one day death will come in and touch you one time in the heart and touch you one time in the lung and say, get out of this house now, you're going to go down and live in the dirt for a while. <laughs> you say, I don't want to go down there. And death says, I'm sorry, I sent to get you. Go down and live in the grave for a while. And you'll leave, and you'll leave everything you had to somebody else and be their stewardship. See? Give an account of thy stewardship. People are funny about God. They think something God's a landlord, you know, or rents the place, or he's a next-door neighbor or somebody. <laughs> God, God owns everything you got, and He gave it to you to take care of. I've been entrusted the talent to paint and uh, and draw and some other things. I'll give an account. I'll give an account. When I when I study real artists, I get very discouraged because I'm not really an artist. I'm kind of a Lord made me. He made a joke in everybody. I don't know what it is. A kind of a mongrel mixture. I don't know what. I'm mean, got to figure it out. I mean, think of putting the soul of an artist and a musician 
into the frame of an artist into the frame of a of a soldier and a and a roughneck. What a what a joke! I tried to learn how to play the violin about three years ago. Somebody bought me one. I gave it up. My fingers won't can't get on the strings. The end of my fingers are all flattened off from hitting things, <laughs> and they they won't go down the strings. I can't get one string on the on the violin. That kind of thing. I've got the soul of a musician. If I could write music, I could write your symphonies. Really, really. I can hear them. I can hear them in my head. I can manufacture them at night. All the parts. Through. But I can't write the stuff down. You see me draw, I don't draw much. I just cartoon that little sketches. That ain't nothing. You know, I, at home I paint. I paint about, I paint 34 baptistries of a thousand portraits and about 4,000 watercolors on a wall else. But when I paint, I can't really paint because uh, I have the soul of an artist, but I'm not an artist. And when I paint, I have to paint the thing over and over again to get it because I can't see the color. A real artist, you know what he does? When he paints, he wears this smock and never gets a spot on it, you know, and, and he, he looks at the thing and sees the color and he mixes the color and then wipes off the brush and then the color. <laughs> There's the color. Then he cleans off his brush and turpentine and back in and there's the color, see. I can't paint that way. And the reason why is I can't see the color. My eyes can only distinguish about a uh, hundred different colors. A real artist can distinguish about six hundred. And when I see a thing, I, th I think I've got the color and I paint it and I look at it, it don't look right. And I do it again. It still don't look right. I do it again. I paint the same thing over fifteen times before I can get it. Now, I know when it looks right. When I get it the way it ought to be, I got it. I may have to hit it 15 times. And the average artist's brush strokes are like this, see? Mine looked like somebody attacked the canvas with a bayonet. It's <laughs> a <laughs> like this, you know. You can't, you can't get me a sable brush that'll last me more than two months. On the canvas, I'll wear it down to a nub. If the brush is wore right down out of the, the metal. You have to take it and throw it out. You see what I'm saying? I'm saying this. When I step out like Frank Rosetta, you know, does those Conan pictures, or Maxwell Parrish, the Maxfield Parrish Brandywine School, or uh, Wyatt, one of those fellows, or a fellow like uh, Norman Rockwell, you know, and so that stuff, I get depressed. Because I can't do that. But let me tell you something. The day of judgment, in the day of judgment, when I give account of my stewardship, any one of those little old pastel chalk talks on a piece of newsprint will be worth anything that Norman Rockwell ever did in a lifetime. And he may get $1,500 for a post cover and all that, but I wouldn't worry about his stuff in the Day of Judgment. Only what's done for Christ will last. Three, then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? My Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. He was a hippie, he didn't dig it. I don't dig it, man, I don't dig it. <laughs> I cannot dig. <laughs> I like that cartoon of that daddy talking to his modern son up here in the winter. And he says, man, it's cool outside. Get out there and dig that crazy snow. <laughs> I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. He's in a fix. I'm resolved what to do. The one I put out of the stewardship, they. Now, that's the people who owed him the money. They, that's people, they may receive me into their houses. He's planning on the people who owed his Lord the money taking care of him when he gets kicked, when he gets the boot. So he called every one of his Lord debtors unto him and said to the first, How much owest thou to my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of all. And he said to him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. That is, uh, he's not going to, he's going to give him a fifty percent cut on it, let him off the hook. How much you owe? More five hundred dollars? Okay, give me two hundred fifty and we'll call even. Oh, pray, oh boy, I appreciate the help. <laughs> so I give him a 250, calls it even, now he's giving this fellow a break, this fellow owes him something, see? Him, for letting him off the hook. All right, verse 6, and he said, a hundred measures of oil, and he said to him, take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, and how much owest thou? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said, take thy bill, and write four score, letting him off the hook. Now, what did he do? He gypped his master. He takes his money and brings it back to the master, and it isn't what the master wanted because it isn't full payment. So he goes in and gets fired. But in doing it, he set himself up 
for these other people. Now they're going to take care of them for taking care of them. And the Lord commended the unjust steward. That is, he spoke highly of him. He fired him. <laughs> but he, he complimented on his, on his craft and being slick. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. He didn't say he'd done right. He didn't say he'd done justly. He'd done wisely, taking care of his own neck, you know. And men will compliment you when you do good to yourself. In plain words, he's saying, that fellow there, he got, he got brains. And he does. He wasn't any good. And he was unjust. <laughs> but some unjust people know good. They got more sense than some Christians. Did you know that, did you know that being a, being a Christian, all things being equal, you ought to be able to outdo a sinner in anything he does? All things being equal, a man who's saved should be able to outdo an unsaved man in anything he does. But if you're a football player and you're the same weight and the same height and have the same training, you'll be able to be his brain out on the line. That's right. If you're a musician, have the same training, you know, the same opportunities, you'll be able to play the instrument he plays that you play. All things being equal, I understand there's so many qualities, but all things being equal, any saved man ought to be able to outdo an unsaved man anything he does. You got the advantage. You got God with you, man. You got God with you. Don't tell me you can do more without God than you can with God. All right, uh, eight. And the Lord commended the unjust to her because he done wisely. For the children of this world, that's the unsaved, lost, crafty, scheming, money grabbing people, Merrill Lynch. The children of this world are in their generation wiser, not better, not good, not right, wiser. They got more wisdom than the children of light. In plain words, unsaved people have more sense than some saved people. So unsaved people are smart and they know the means to use to get to attain the ends they want. Saved people, they flounder. Saved people don't use wisdom in attaining the ends they got in mind. And I say unto you, and this is a choice, make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Now that isn't directly will. That's if you're not going to be right, then you'd better do what the steward did. If you're going to be unjust, then do what the steward did. Make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Now there's that of again. So the thing flipped you? You thought it said be friends with money, didn't you? You thought it was the object, it's the subject. That of really throw you. That thing says, make yourself friends by what? By using the money. Take the money and get yourself friends with the money. How you know he meant that? Because that's what he just said. The fellow just done that. He just got him some friends by letting them off the hook financially. So it all doesn't mean make friends of dollar bills. It doesn't say get plenty with dollar bills and make money. It's saying make you friends with the money. See, that of is, that of is tough. That thing goes either way. Let me show you one like this. What's the truth of God? Is that the truth about God, or is that the truth God gives you? Well, normally it could be either. All right, nine. Make yourselves friends of the mammon of righteousness. Now, if you want to get it where you can understand it in uh, with no ambigu ambiguity, then you'd put... Make yourselves friends by using the mammon of unrighteousness, or with the mammon of unrighteousness, or take the mammon of righteousness make yourself some friends. Make yourselves friends of the mammon of righteous, that when ye fail, like the steward did, they, the friends you make, not the money, the friends you make, they may receive you in everlasting habitation, take care of the rest of your life. So I said, if you're going to be unjust, then put the money to good use and make you some friends with it. All right, that'll be all about Thank you. All right, I want uh, Brother Rex Harrison to come and sing some for us right now. And then we'll tell you something else. Thank you. 